The sponsor of the video is PCBWay. Now they're one of the top PCB manufacturers out there and you can quickly have your projects ready made for you within 24 hours with their 24 hour service. They also do have assembly and flashing services and it's the company I always use whenever I create a product and or project. So go ahead and check the links down below. Hey, what is up guys and welcome back. So in today's video, we're going to be discussing the differences between the Crazy Bee type boards and hopefully teach you a thing or two into making your next purchase order to be a bit more educated. So there's two types in the market here, which we're going to be covering today in great detail and helping you understand what are the differences and what are the benefits and also the downfalls of each. And also everything is linked down below in the timestamp so you can skip to whatever part you want. And we're also going to be covering the 20 amp version of this board here. I've already done the 30 amp overview as a basic one. So we're also going to do the connection guide for this uh, later on in the video. So if you want to check that out, you can just skip there. So we're looking at two crazy B type boards. We have the novice three, which is a really good example. And also the GH411 AIO. Now these are rated for quite a lot. And the reason for that is, is because of the way they are designed. Now, before we get into design, we have a normal ESC here on the right side. Hopefully it's on the right side. And what we see, this is the Tico 32. This is your typical uh, design feature of any ESC, any proper large ESC. And as you can tell here, we have six FETs. Now, each motor wire, as we can tell, we have three motor wires that will connect to this ESC. Each motor wire is called a phase. Now, each phase has two dedicated FETs connected to it, just like this. So that is just a basic concept of, or the basic design concept of an ESC. Now, also in the market, there are FETs that come with both of these into one package, just like that. Now, when that happens, it's usually not as strong or not as durable as you'd like it to be because you know, it depends on what you're designing it for. But with these, it's it's a hit and miss most of the time because in a crash, it, things could go bad. And I'll explain what that means in a bit here. So here we have the novice. The novice is rocking the dual channel FET, which means it's just rocking one FET that has both FETs inside for each phase. So if we also start counting them, we'll find 12 here we'll find 12 FETs that are dual channel. So times two, which would be 24, but it is 12 FETs. Now, if we look at the GH411, as you can tell, it's, it's stating that it could do quite a lot. And the reason for that, and they can say that, is because it's rocking two dedicated FETs for each phase, just like our normal ESCs here. So if we actually start counting the FETs on here, we'll find 24 dedicated ones. So here we can actually start seeing them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 9, 10, 11, 12. And then if we go here, we should have another 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 24 FETs dedicated. These are dedicated. These are the dual channel. So we'll say dual channel. I always forget how to spell dual. So I'll just write it both ways so people don't complain. All right. So that is the main difference. It comes down to the ESC. Now, you're like, okay, well, what does it have to do with anything? Well, have you ever gotten into a crash with one of these boards and all of a sudden your motor is just stuttering and it's not turning? And the reason for that is one of the FETs went bad. And because each FET is in charge of a magnetic pole, so it'll turn one on, turn the other one off, turn one on, turn the other one off. Now, when you see your motor stuttering and not turning, it's because, let's just say, one is turning, the other one is turning, and the last one's not turning, but then it goes back to that first one and it just stutters back and forth. That's due to a bad fit. Most of these boards will end up having that, especially in a crash. However, the fix is pretty simple. I mean, it's a, it's all it is is you need to change the fit, but you need to figure out which fit to buy and you need to know how to solder that thing back on there. Now, if you do that, your board is basically back to new and you'll be able to use it just fine. That's if you don't push any of the other components out of place or anything of that nature. But it is a really nice thing to try to attempt because these FETs are usually pretty cheap, but you also need to figure out exactly which FET was being used, which I wish more manufacturers actually put that in their specifications. So, we'll so we would be actually be able to fix them if we ever needed to. Now, the advantages of having 24 FETs, dedicated FETs, just like we have on the GH411, is you'll be able to truly handle more amperage, and you'll also be able to ha have better heat dissipation. And one of the main things that usually will tend to ruin a, a FET is the heat. So a lot of power is going through, and it generates a lot of heat, then it just melts or fries or whatever that happens. And that is the case in crashes. So that's why I always, I always recommend, or I always recommended, to turn off air mode, 
in your little micro. And that's the reason why some companies ship them out with air mode off because in a crash, so let's just say you crash and you're about, you're falling down, your quadcopter is trying to correct itself. And while it's doing that, it's pushing a lot of amperage into your motor. And while it's doing that, let's just say your motor hit a tree branch and it stopped, then all that amperage that's in the motor, once the, the, the electromagnetic field collapses, then everything just gets pushed back into the fence and then you fry it. And then that's why you turn it back on and all of a sudden you see your motor stuttering. It's because you just burnt the FET. But most of these boards will still work just fine if you just replace the FET, really. And and it's, yeah, it's just that simple. Now, if we go to the dual channel FETs, there is also a benefit. However, durability will be less. By how much, it's really hard to say, depending on the quality of the FET. I'm not saying the 24 FET is always better, but it's more likely going to be better in handling a lot more. Then again, depending on the quality of the MOSFETs that are being used. Now, the advantage, for example, why did the novice just use 12 dual channel FETs? Well, there is no space. And why is that? Well, because it has a built-in receiver as well. So there are advantages and also disadvantages. Now, another advantage of using a dual FET is less weight. So if, you, if you're rocking a, let's just say, not power-hungry toothpick or a micro, then you should be okay with a dual channel FET. But if you wanted something that is going to be crashing quite a lot and it's going to be running maybe 4S, 4S, I definitely recommend you go with dedicated FETs, so like a 24 FET board. And just, um, and just in the long run, it should theoretically be better. Again, theoretically, this is just all hopefully going to help you make an educated guess on your next purchase. Now, the GH F411 AIO 20 and 30 amp, I have not personally tested yet. I will be setting them up on a build very soon. But theoretically, they, they should handle quite a lot. I mean, the 30 amp, I think, would handle uh, 25. The 20 amp, I think, should handle, I mean, not full 20 amp. You're not going to be able to get 20 amps out of these little ports. But um, if it's saying 20 amps, then, then you're less likely to burn a FET because um, the FETs here are going to be much more powerful. Now, other than that, everything is basically identical on all these boards. We have the same OSD chip. So check this out, OSD. We have the same F4, some other the microcontroller unit here what we have is we have a little bit of extra stuff on the uh, novice uh, in this area right here is because this is for the receiver part right there so that's what that would be either this or this here I don't know which one is the gyro because I can't currently read and one of them is going to be the gyro one's going to one of them is going to be the chip for the uh, basically the uh, S bus receiver that's in here or the FR sky receiver that's in here I'm guessing it's probably going to be this one and we all, all of them, every single ESC from the baby ones like these to this ones will also have the same four tier FET driver here. We have a 3.3 volt regulator. And if we take a closer look here, we should have a 3.3 volt regulator somewhere on the GH. Uh, I currently can't find it. It's camouflaged. Somewhere. Oh, there it is. It's right there. And um, also another thing to look for when purchasing these boards, which again is really, really important is filtration now you can get away with putting a low ESR capacitor but always having inbuilt filtration is always much better now if you take a look at the gh here it's actually camouflaged the amount of filtration this thing has is, is quite remarkable for a tiny board look at this one two three four five six seven eight nine ten look at this it's just they're just camouflaged everywhere look at that that's just crazy right there that's all for filtration right here. This might be for something else, like a 3.3 volt right here. But um, yeah, th most of these are for filtration for the ESC, which is really, really great here. This is, I think, for the voltage regulator. Two of these are going to be for the OSD because the OSD chip always needs it in the schematic. Actually needs a four. So I think these four right here uh, could be for the OSD. But it, none, it doesn't matter really because we do have great filtration for such a tiny board that is also rocking full-fledged 24 FETs. And this goes for the 20 and the 30 amp. Personally, I saw the 30 amp version's uh, build quality much better than the 20, which I also have linked down below. Uh, so if you wanted a proper board, I, I don't promise you it's a proper board, but from the design aspect, it seems to be the much more durable board in terms of crashing. And that is personally what I would recommend or I would test or set up on a quadcopter if I didn't know any better. I would say, okay, well, this looks better. 24 FETs, really great filtration. Uh, let's go for this one because I want something that's going to last and I don't want to keep replacing this. I'm not saying that the dual channel FETs won't last as well, but depending on your setup, 
Um, you know, it's always better to have dedicated feds, but let's just say you wanted the inbuilt receiver, then you're going to just go with, for example, a board like the novice three right here. It's not a bad board. I've used it and it's still handling very well. But again, I won't recommend it for high load applications. If you're going to be maybe using like 3.5 inch propellers on your micro, then you're going to want to hit up the GHF 411 AIO or something of this design aspect. And also take a look at the filtration. It's always really good to have inbuilt filtration. And I, I, even though this has all the filtration, I still recommend you add low ESR capacitor. And the place where you'd add that is right here with the power rails on this board. And same thing goes for the uh, novice here. You would add that round here. I'll actually have linked an XT30 with a pre-built uh, low ESR capacitor, which I usually use. It's just less headache. It comes right there on the XT30 uh, and it's, it's very, very useful. So with that being said, I really hope someone learned something. Let's go ahead and jump into the connection guide of the GH411 AIO. All right, guys, so right now we're gonna be covering the FPV camera connection setup for this board. So there's three main wires we always wanna take a look at, which is the power, which is VCC or five volt, ground and video on every camera. So there's three main wires that always must be connected in order to have everything work correctly. Now, one thing to always take note of is the arrow key right here. That means this should be installed in your quadcopter exactly in this orientation. The camera should be up here on the frame. And this means the front of the quadcopter, just like this in a diamond shape here, because this is a crazy B type board. So first of all, let's start with the power output for the camera here. So the first wire we're gonna start off with is going to be the ground, which is going to be connected on this right here. Now take note of the USB as well. So there's our ground right there. And all that's gonna go is to, it's just gonna go right into the black wire of your camera where it says ground. So that will give it ground. Next thing we need is five volts. And again, I always recommend you add these to five volt regulators, even though your, your camera might be able to take more voltage, it's much better to stick it on a stable five volt with no fluctuation of voltage so you don't get weird lines in your video feed. So here we go, five volts, five volt line. And the last one is just going to be video. Now, if you take a closer look also after the video, you'll find this blue line called OSD. However, in this case, we don't have this, so we really don't need it. And this doesn't mean your on-screen display. Your on-screen display is right there. But this allows uh, some flight controllers to control the settings of the camera. However, here, again, we don't have that, so we completely ignore it. These are the most important wires, the video line and the power for the camera. So this would be the video input. And like that, your camera should be ready to go and you're basically set. So let's go ahead and move on to the next step. All right, guys, so now we're going to be covering the FPV video transmitter part. Now, before connecting it, you need to make sure of your video transmitter's power input level because there's two in the market. There's ones that take seven volts plus and there's ones that only take five volts only and it's a very important step to always make sure so you don't fry your video transmitter and also just have it boot sometimes you'll fry it depending on what you have and sometimes it just won't boot so this one here takes the seven plus volts so as the name implies we could take anything above seven volts to power on our video transmitter and now we're going to be covering both of these and let's go ahead and start with the seven volts plus since that's what we have in front of us right here so let's go ahead and start with the vcc so vcc right here which is the red wire of a video transmitter if it takes seven plus volts is going to be connected along with your battery's power right here so this is where your xt30 will be connected on this this is the red wire as you can tell it says plus so this is something called v bat plus which is the battery's voltage plus line which is the power line so here we have set up the seven volt plus video transmitter connection now if you have a five volt video transmitter then you're going to want to take the second one right here so we'll just move that like that and then we'll say here I will just go like this and say five volts. So if your video transmitter is five volt, you'll take the red wire from here. If it's seven plus volts, you'll take it from the battery right there. Now the ground is basically identical on both five and also the seven plus volts here. So we should just go just like that right there. And the next one over is going to be very important, which is going to be our video line. Now, so if you ever boot up your, your quadcopter and you know your, your, your yellow line is not connected, what you will get is just a black screen with nothing. Now, if you get a black screen with the OSD, then that means something's wrong with the camera. Now, if you get static, that means something's wrong with the video transmitter and or you're on the wrong channel. And the next one is going to be our video line, which again is very important here. So we're just gonna set that up right on that pad right there. Sorry about the crossover, but I can't do anything about it. All right, so that's where we would get our video line. So we'll call it vid. Next one over is going to be the five volts. So if you're a five volt, this is where you take it from. And this is going to be ground, which is uh, pretty basic here. So we'll just say ground. And this one's going to be ground. 
and this is going to be the seven plus volts like I mentioned. So if your video transmitter takes anything above seven volts, then that's where you wanna go ahead and grab it from. Very important you do that. Now, this also has in mind smart audio or the IRC tramp protocol. And where you'd wanna set that up is going to be right here. The one right next to the video is gonna be a T pad. So let's just move this right here. So this is going to be TX1. So TX1 is going to be UART1 on your Betaflight's ports tab. And make sure you enable your smart audio and or tramp protocol. And the place where you connect it, I'll show you right now. Or the IRC tramp protocol. And that's going to be connected to your smart audio port or IRC, depending on what kind of uh, video transmitter you have in protocol. It's gonna connect in the same place, but you just choose it in the Betaflight's ports tab differently, depending on what protocol. And that's basically it for the video transmitter. Let's go ahead and move on to the next part. All right, so in this part of the video, I'm going to be showing you how to connect whether you have an S bus receiver and or I bus from FlySky. So let's first start off with the power. Now for both of those receivers from FRSky and FlySky, they always take five volts and obviously ground to power them up. So the ground and the five volts are gonna go exactly in the same position. Now let's go ahead and start with the five volts because it's kind of interesting on this flight controller if you've never seen this before. So the place where we wanna actually get five volts is this pad. Now, if you take a closer look at the documentation, this pad says 4.5 volts. And then you're like, no, 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 I need five volts. Why is this a 4.5? Well, whenever you see a pad that says 4.5, that means it'll allow power to go through when you connect it via USB. So that's really great. So when you're gonna bind, all you gotta do is connect to USB instead of getting a battery and removing your propellers. So you can just stick that USB in there, it'll power on the receiver, and you can go ahead and bind it. It's very useful, so I really like that. So that's where you would want to connect your five volts on the 4.5 volt rail. Now, the next one is going to be ground. And again, these are exactly identical, whether you have an IBUS and or an S bus receiver here. So it's gonna go right there. So that's where you connect our ground. Now our receiver basically has power. So the only thing left is going to be our signal wires. So for S bus also, it's going to be very simple. It's gonna be this pad right here. And that way we have S bus completely finished. Now, if you have iBus, the place where you want to go ahead and connect your receiver wire is going to be on this pad right here, right there. And UART2 on this flight controller, which is very important, the ports tab, you should check this serial RX box because that is where the receivers are connected, whether you have iBus or S bus. And then you'd go in your configuration and then change it to the appropriate protocol, whether it's I bus or S bus. However, UART2 in your ports tab is going to be for your receiver, whether it's an S bus or an I bus, especially if you use this setup right here. And that's really it. I mean, it's really that simple. There's nothing else to it. The 4.5 volt uh, pads I really love because they give the power when you plug in the USB so you can debug what's going on with your receiver, double check your channel setup so you don't have to have the video transmitter running the whole time when you have your battery plugged in. So I really like seeing that pad and I like that they went that route. So it's really nice. Uh, and again, I, I really like that actually. And well, that's it guys. So I really hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope someone learned a thing or two. Hopefully it'll help you make your next uh, educated purchase. And also I do a ton of giveaways. And if you find this content very useful, it would be really great if you could support me on Patreon. I do a ton of giveaways. You get access to my open schematic flight controller, open hardware flight controller, ESC. You get so many perks and you also get access to my secret shop, which is an insane place to be. Um, and yeah, just go ahead and check my Patreon. You can see the giveaways I do and new Patreons. Like for example, I got like four new ones this month. There's going to be a separate giveaway between those four, like a premium giveaway other than the rest of the giveaway. So yeah, I really hope you guys enjoyed the video. Come support the channel. Also check the links down below. Those greatly support the channel as well. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace out.